The election of 2016 was brought to you by my lovely patrons, Thomas Johnson, James Rapp, John Mezzo, and Lewis. For as little as three Australian dollars a month, you can get your name shouted out at the start of every Sawmon video, as well as access to bonus behind the scenes content, link in the description below. Following yet another short and chaotic Labour government, the coalition was yet again back in power. In his victory speech, recently elected Prime Minister Tony Abbott promised to be a government of no surprises. So let's see how well he did. Wait, again? Seriously? Can we not have a Prime Minister last more than three years? Following the election of 2013, the coalition was back in power with a giant 90-seat majority. Unlike his predecessors who had run on meeting the previous government's policies halfway, Abbott had run on drastically opposing the previous government, and with his giant mandate Abbott would immediately get to work. Straight from day one, Abbott would abolish the carbon tax as well as begin Operation Sovereign Borders, a zero-tolerance policy aimed at the asylum seekers attempting to enter Australia by boat. This operation would soon become a major target of humanitarian groups who took aim at the cruelty being thrust upon asylum seekers attempting to get into Australia. The government would defend its decision, arguing that showing zero tolerance was deterring asylum seekers from attempting to enter into Australia on unseaworthy vessels, thus risking their lives. The government would also continue to keep up refugee quotas in an attempt to show concern for the plight of asylum seekers. Upon taking office, Abbott had promised to put Australia back in business. This would involve the mass repeal of several so-called red tape regulations. This all culminated in the 2014 budget written by Abbott's treasurer, Joe Hockey. This budget featured major downsizing of government spending to bring the budget back into surplus in the face of the GFC. This meant major cuts to education funding and healthcare, despite Abbott previously promising not to cut such funding. As a result, the budget was viewed extremely unfavourably by the public and Abbott's approval ratings would drop. While the 2014 budget would hurt Abbott's image, his biggest plunder would come soon after. In early 2014, Abbott would make the odd choice to bring back knights and damehood. This move was met with mixed reception from Australians who had no idea why such an archaic system was being reintroduced. However, that mixed reception would soon run sour when on Australia Day 2015, Abbott would announce the knighting of the Queen's late husband, Prince Philip, a man who had done little for Australia, yet alone even lived there. The move looked more like Abbott sucking up to the royal family than acknowledging an exceptional Australian. Abbott was quickly losing his support from the Australian public. His budget was seen as unfairly cruel to regular Australians, and his knighting of Prince Philip had put his priorities into serious questioning. He was also facing attacks due to the lack of women in his front bench, as well as the lack of a serious climate policy. This would eventually lead to a leadership spill in February 2015 to depose Abbott as leader. Abbott would emerge victorious after no one came forward to challenge him, however a whole third of the party had voted against him regardless. With such a large majority of the party voting against his leadership, Abbott promised to reform his leadership style going into 2015. This involved making less so-called captain calls and being more cooperative with the moderate faction of his party who ordered more action on social justice and climate change. Warning: Skip to the following timestamp if you wish to avoid me mentioning the topic of the Lint Cafe siege. This revival attempt would immediately see some success when in 2014 a terrorist group known as ISIS would take over a large amount of territory in Iraq and Syria. ISIS would encourage its supporters around the world to partake in terrorist attacks and this would lead to one man taking 10 customers and 8 employees hostage at the Lint Cafe in downtown Sydney. After a 16 hour standoff, police would have stormed the cafe and killed the man, but not before two hostages had died. This attack would galvanise the public support to eliminate ISIS, and Australia would send troops to Iraq again as a part of an international coalition. This would initially help Abbott gain support in the polls, and it seemed like Abbott could potentially pull off what Howard had done in 2001, and use national security to bring the public back on the coalition's side. However, the election was still a year away, and Hockey had another budget to present. Hockey's 2015 budget, despite not being as brutal as the 2014 one, would again be met with tepid reaction, and the coalition still found itself trailing Labour in the polls. Worse yet for the coalition, a scandal would emerge when House Speaker Bronwyn Bishop was found to have used taxpayer money to charter a helicopter between Melbourne and Geelong to attend a Liberal Party fundraiser. 
Despite the negative press and other accusations that Bishop was not respecting her apolitical position as Speaker, Abbott refused to sack Bishop and would defend her. This would only hurt Abbott's image even more, especially after Bishop resigned on her own accord. What then followed was the disastrous 2015 Queensland state election, where first-term Premier Campbell Newman would be utterly defeated losing his own seat and government to a Labour Party of only seven members, led by Anastasia Palaszczuk. While several factors had led to the loss, blame would soon be aimed at Tony Abbott, who had made himself front and centre in the campaign, despite being highly unpopular. Desperate not to follow the footsteps of Labour and sack their leader, the coalition attempted to tolerate Abbott, hoping that things would turn around, but it was coming increasingly clear that Abbott was going to make the coalition the first one-term government since James Scullin in 1931. With their backs against the wall, the party would look to another figure to be the face of the party, re-enter Malcolm Turnbull. Born in Sydney 1954, Turnbull would initially work in law before establishing an investment banking firm. Throughout this time, Turnbull had dabbled into politics, initially trying to win the seat of Wentworth in 1981, then Lowe in 1982, both times being unsuccessful. Following this, Turnbull would leave the Liberal Party and instead worked on making Australia a republic. Leading both committee and later campaign, Turnbull would become a major recognisable face in the public sphere, gaining support from both sides of politics. With his newfound popularity, Turnbull would rejoin the Liberal Party in 2000, and in 2004 would beat up former Liberal member Peter King to win Wentworth. Much like with the rest of the party, Turnbull had been hesitant to challenge Abbott, wishing to avoid Labour's chaotic leadership changes. But left with no other choice, and a backbench begging for a more popular leader, Turnbull would challenge Abbott on the 14th of September 2015, and would win 54 votes to Abbott's 44. Immediately upon taking over the leadership, Turnbull would reshuffle Abbott's front bench to include more female ministers, dump the unpopular hockey, as well as push forward new climate policy. This would initially see major success, and the coalition would finally begin pulling ahead of Labour again. Speaking of Labour, they too would be running with a new face. Following Rudd's resignation from Parliament, two faces would emerge to take over as leader. Anthony Albanese, the former Deputy Prime Minister, and Bill Shorten, the former Minister for Education. Shorten would emerge victorious. However, his ascension to the leadership was controversial due to the wider party backing Albanese. Born in Melbourne in 1967, Shorten would grow up to become a major leader in the Labour's right faction. This would carry through his early career, taking on multiple jobs, but never being too far from a politician. In 1996, Shorten would attempt to win pre-selection for the seat of Maribyong, but would lose to Bob Sercom. Shorten would then go into Victorian state politics, but would keep an eye on Sercom and Maribyong. Eventually, after three subsequent defeats to Howard, Shorten would go for the federal seat again, arguing that Labour needed a team change, to which Sercom agreed and would step down, allowing Shorten to win the seat in 2007. Throughout his time in the Rudd and Gillard governments, Shorten would be a pivotal figure controlling the Victorian right faction. This made Shorten the key figure in both leadership spills, first abandoning Rudd to elect Gillard, and then changing sides to put Rudd back in. As a result, Shorten was seen as the PM killer, a title that would haunt him throughout his time leading the Labour Party. In an attempt to regain the Labour Party's image, Shorten would follow Abbott's opposition leader strategy and would aggressively attack the coalition governments for their many flaws, leading to Parliament becoming somewhat of a slugfest of attacks. As a result, a lot of Australians, especially women, would become quite disillusioned with Parliament and would look towards third parties. Speaking of third parties, Turnbull was struggling with passing legalisation and desired a much smaller crossbench from the current one of 18 members. This resulted in the abolition of group voting tickets, meaning that above-the-line voters would decide their own party preferences rather than the party themselves. Along with this, Turnbull desired a double dissolution election to clean up the Senate. To achieve such an election, Turnbull would attempt to pass four bills, most notable of which was the Building and Construction Industry Bill, which sought to regulate the Building and Construction Union and was deeply unpopular in the Labour ranks. Thus, with Labour and the crossbench blocking the bill, Turnbull had got his desired double dissolution, and with his new voting rules and strong popularity, he hoped for an easy win as election day approached. Without preference deals, third parties were now to fight to keep their position in the Senate. Following their first major decline in votes in over a decade, Christine Mill would pass the role of Greens leader over to Richard Di Natale, who would attempt to regain voters who had abandoned them in 2013. In South Australia, popular independent Nick Xenophon would establish his own party known as the Nick Xenophon Team, and would even hire off several lower house seats. And in Tasmania, Palm United turned independent Senator Jackie Lambie would too establish her own party, and look to win her Senate seat outright without Palmer's help. 
Speaking of Palmer, by election day his party had practically imploded, with most of his senators abandoning the party and Palmer himself opting not to recontest Fairfax. With the collapse of Palmer United, a large void in voters looking for a new party had emerged and a certain controversial party looked to take advantage. Since losing Blair, Pauline Hanson had retreated from political life and this would coincide with the decline in her One Nation party. However, with the public debate around illegal boat arrivals and Islamic terrorism, Hanson would make a big comeback into the political scene, replacing her swamped by Asians rhetoric with a swamped by Muslims one. Hanson would again attempt to play off racial tensions to gain votes. As election day approached, a debate began to grow around the recognition of same-sex marriage following a wave of legalizations across Europe and North America. Labour and the Greens would immediately pledge to legalize same-sex unions if they were elected. Meanwhile, Turner would face challenges. Despite personally supporting such unions, the large conservative faction of his party did not. In an attempt to compromise, Turner would propose a national plebiscite to legalize same-sex marriage. This grew outrage from progressives since polling had already shown such unions overwhelmingly popular, and due to the nature of a plebiscite, equal funding would be allocated to both pro and anti same-sex marriage voices, allowing anti-LGBT content free airtime to play in front of individuals struggling with their sexual identity. And with that, the election was set for the 2nd of July 2016, and the now 20-year-old me would finally be able to vote. While not my first election, that being the extremely close 2014 South Australian state election, this would be my first federal election, and it would be a double dissolution, meaning I'd be filling out one giant Senate voting ticket. Fun. By election day, Turnbull had lost his luster. Despite being elected to bring politics back to a moderate middle ground, it was clear the Conservatives still controlled the party's policy, and Turnbull was merely a moderate figurehead. As a result, voters would again abandon the party, leading to polls drastically narrowing up right before election day, making the end result anyone's guess. And the winner was? As counting began, the swing against the government looked to be large as seats fell to Labour, and the result looked to be eerily similar to the 2010 election, as Turnbull struggled to meet the 76 seat requirement to form government. Eventually, after days of counting, Turnbull was just able to reach the 76 seat mark, along with 50.36% of the vote, the slimmest margin since Menzies' 1961 re-election. The results were even worse in the Senate. Despite the voting changes being designed to stop votes going to random third parties, the sheer number of disgruntled voters and the double dissolution halving the quota requirements to get in would grow the crossbench to a whopping 20 members. The coalition had lost three seats, with most being picked up by One Nation, who now had four seats in the upper house. Another big benefactor would be Xenophon, who would get two additional senators elected in South Australia, along with himself. Also, Rebecca Sharkey would gain the lower house seat of Mayo off the coalition, giving the party clout on the federal level. This led to ideas being raised if Xenophon was the new Don Ship, bringing forward a new centrist party. While the Greens would recoup a bit of their losses from 2013, they would still end up losing one seat to Xenophon in South Australia, and would fail to gain any more lower house seats. Much like Beasley before him, Shorten had seen the Labour Party through another quick turnaround, and they were once again competitive. Following rules established by the Rudd-Gillard saga, Shorten would resign due to losing the election. But with 69 seats, and 49.64% of the two party preferred, he would be immediately re-elected as leader and now had a lot more confidence that Labour was going to be back in government very soon. However, despite the strong showing in the two party preferred, the Labour Party had won just under 35% of the first preferences, with most of their candidates winning their seats off the back of third party preferences. Was this truly a comeback for the Labour Party, or had they only seen a fluke rise in their seat numbers? Come back next time for the election of 2019.